I was uh, caught uh, caught out a little bit this morning. I uh, arrived and realised you, you've got to, it's tricky with Bibles, isn't it? Even if you're all with the NIV, you realise there's lots of different versions of the NIV, so I think you're using the 1983 one. Anyway, um, the key word that I kind of centred my sermon on is not there in your version of the <laughs> We'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but anyway, hopefully you've got the little handout. Um, if you've still got your coloured pens, you can do some colouring in. You still have uh, But hopefully while you're listening. Psalm 19. Last week I got a, a letter from a Christian friend, and it went like this. I just don't have a sense of God's presence. When I look at the sky, I don't see God, and when I talk about anything faith-related, I feel like I'm lying. Today, I prayed that God would send the Holy Spirit to give me, my, to give me hope, but so far, nothing has happened. It seems like God is just not here. Well, I wonder if you can relate to that. Uh, I could as I read it, I think there are times all of us have, aren't there, where we um, feel that God is quite distant and we wonder, well, where can I get refreshment, uh, revival for my soul in hard times? And if you have a look at Psalm 19, uh, in any version of the Bible, <laughs> which you've got, uh, there's a word in verse 7 and I want to focus in on that one. Well, I want to focus in on this, this verse, really. Um, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. In, in other versions, refreshing the soul. How can we get refreshment from the Lord? And uh, I think this psalm helps us. This psalm, psalm uh, would help my friend who wrote to me. The psalms are poems, of course, and people of, the people of Israel would have sung the Psalms, uh, and they would have known a lot of them off by heart. And this Psalm, if you look at the top there, um, clearly it is a song, isn't it? Because it, it begins for the director of music. And I think there are three uh, chunks to the to the Psalm which help us to understand it. And I've, put, I've got those down as uh, sun, word, rock. Sun, word, rock. So there's the three sections on, on the little handout that you've got, which is where we're, we're going to go this morning. So first of all, um, the first chunk, verses 1 to 6, this is kind of giving us a bit of, a, a bit of context for that verse 7, which I want to focus in on. Uh, and as you would have picked up as Hannah read it, verses 1 to 6 are all about creation. Creation is declaring God's glory. Maybe early on this morning we wouldn't have thought that, but now we can look out the window and think, yes, that's true, I see that. Um, and it's wonderful picture language here, isn't it? I wonder if you picked up what's happening in this kind of a bit strange, I think, verses, uh, verses 5 uh, and 6, the bridegroom and the champion, all sorts of word language uh, that the psalmist is using here. He's really going, going to town on this. Well, I think he's describing sunrise and sunset. Uh, the sunset is the, is the sun going down into the tent at the end of the day. And the sunrise is the bridegroom coming up out of the tent in the morning. And of course, I think that in those days the sun was much more important to the extent that a lot of people around Israel would have worshipped the sun um, and, and really understood it as life-giving in, in a way that perhaps we've lost sight of. Um, people worshipped the sun and, you know, the, the sun was a sort of Johnny Depp uh, of the day, Kim Kardashian of the day, so, you know, we worship these influencers, worship these celebrities. Well, in those days, people worship the sun. So part of what I think the psalmist wants to do here is to push back on the, the kind of local belief systems that people had and say, he's saying, look, you know, don't worship the sun, worship the one who created the sun, worship the one who's behind the sun. You know, it's a bit like um, you, you have a wonderful experience of God's creation. Uh, which, in a way, we were picking up on with the exercise that Hannah was leading us through this morning. Uh, poetry, <coughs> uh, art, work, sailing, food, anything you can think of in culture, all those wonderful things are gifts to us from God. 
But of course the problem is very easily we lose sight of the creator, we lose sight of the one who's behind, and a bit like the people in those days with the sun, we become fixated on the creation itself. And so we, our, our time is, is taken up with, I mean we wouldn't say well I worship movies, but our time is taken up with, with say movies, or our time is taken up with the culture. Important that is, as it is, we lose sight of the Creator. So that's a bit of the context for verse 7. Now why, what, what's, what's the psalmist doing here? Why has he got this first chunk about the Son? And then why does he suddenly switch in verse 7 to the Lord? It, doesn't it? It's a, bit, it's a bit curious, isn't it? A sudden kind of change of tone. And here's what I think he's trying to get across to us. Is, He's saying, you know, all the, the creation is amazing, but here's something even more amazing than the creation, and that's God's word. The creation is amazing, but the, the, the law, or the Torah, which will be, you know, the Hebrew word, is even more amazing than creation. And so, a second section, word, verses 7 to 11. Creation is amazing, but creation can't give you a purpose for life. Um, isn't, isn't that what we see around us? So, so, much, so many problems in the modern world, I think of course because people have, don't really have a purpose. Um, they they realise that, yeah, these creative things are wonderful, but what, what's, what's after that? What's after that? I have a wonderful experience. What's after that? What's next after that? And then of course eventually people know, if they're honest, it all will come to an end. But, verse 7, the law of the Lord, what does it do? It revives the soul, it refreshes the soul, it gives us purpose. And so God's law is our, our real soul food. Now, here's, I think we've got a problem here with this. That, that word law is, if you're honest, isn't it a bit of a turn off? Um, you know, you only think about law in our culture if you've got a problem. Uh, and if you think too hard about law, you realize it's going to be a very big bill at the end of the day. Uh, so, so law is a bit of a turn-off. So we've got to think about, well, what, it, what did it mean to the, the people in Israel originally? To the people in Israel originally, it was very attractive. The law, the Torah, it spoke of the whole of their relationship to God. It, it's not just rules. It's kind of a shorthand for... For everything in there, the, the everything that God has given them in speaking to them, in saving them, in bringing them out of uh, slavery in Egypt, and then showing them, well, this is what you have to do to live as my people. Uh, it's the law of the Lord. Have a look at it there. You know, it's not just the law of the nation. It's the law of the Lord, Yahweh. So it's very personal, isn't it? It's my, God's saying, the Lord is saying, it's my, it's my law. You know, if you go, I don't know if in New Zealand, but in England, um, when I worked in, in the legal side of things, you know, the judges wore wigs. Do you know why they wear wigs? Um, it's so that they look impersonal. It's so that they all look the same. Um, it's deliberately designed so that the law is an impersonal thing. So when you go to court, you feel like you're getting unbiased, unprejudiced um, decisions. So that's the reason why they wear the wigs, not because they look, you know, look fashionable, which they don't, of course. So the, the law is, but, but this law here, see, it's Yahweh's law. It's very personal. It's not impersonal at all. And so this is shorthand for everything God has given Israel everything he wants to do to, to shape them. So the first section we've seen, verse 1, 6, the sun, uh, and now the word. And they're in some ways the same, but in important, important ways they're, they're different. They're the same, but well, the, what does the sun do? The sun uh, gives life, doesn't it? Uh, apparently, if, if the sun suddenly stopped working, then within six months there would be no life left on Earth. Apart from uh, some little microorganisms at the bottom of the ocean which could just get enough heat from the Earth's core 
uh, to keep going. Otherwise, it will all be dead. Um, what happens to God's people if we don't get the word anymore? Well, if you look at church history, it's the same. We, eventually, the church will die. Um, we need God's word in the same way that the, the earth needs, the creation needs the sun. So that's one of the things which is um, is the same. And I guess, you know, we look around the, the church in New Zealand, here's a challenge for us, isn't it? Is the word, re are we getting the word as much as we could? Or are we losing that focus a little bit? That's a question we've got, we, we need to keep um, grappling with, I think. Uh, we need to keep grappling with it because it's very easy to shift onto other things. I mean, look at the Garden of Eden. Um, you know, what happened there? The Adam and Eve surrounded by wonderful creation, beauty, wonderful food, uh, and then God, but God also spoke to them. So you had the creation and you had God's word, and which won out in the end? I suppose often the creation appears much, much more attractive, doesn't it, uh, than, than this? Really? Is this all we've got? Well, this is actually enough, isn't it, according to verse 7? And I, I guess I think, you know, why do so many people lose their way spiritually? Um, because at the end of the day, people think, word, world... I have the world. Word just seems limiting, repressive, out of date, all sorts of other things. But God says, my law is refreshing, it's reviving. Uh, which of course is a great word for um, advertisers. Uh, Henry, I don't know if we can flip up those uh, slides there please. You've probably seen adverts which talk about, uh, this is a Quite a famous from, one from a while ago, Heineken beer, refreshes the parts of the beer cannot reach. And then the next one, please. I'm too far away. You stuck on that one? You're stuck on the beer. That's all right. <laughs> uh, juicy and delicious soul food. Doesn't actually look super delicious. And then the last one as well. Uh, you might be able to read that, but it says, be really refreshed. Uh, now, these are kind of trite, quite small examples, but isn't, isn't that a little, a, a lot of what the kind of narrative of the modern world, whether you're thinking music, or movies, or advertising, or holidays, or leisure, is about finding new life, uh, finding refreshment, finding, finding uh, personal revival through these different things. And that's not wrong, but can it last? That's the thing. Um, of course, advertisers need to constantly update their products and will even you know, build into them planned obsolescence so that they, they break down after a while, so you have to then go and buy a new one. Um, so we chase the sun for our holidays, but do, do we chase the word of God, which is really more valuable uh, to us. So let's just recap quickly that the, the psalmist is saying, look, creation is amazing, culture is amazing, everything that we can include within creation, it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's God's gift. But what can't creation do? Can't creation can't bring you into a relationship with God. And that is what you are made for. And I wonder if you notice something which the psalmist uses to show this. In the first section, in verses 1 to 6, um, how is, how is, um, how, what's the word for God there? This is not a hard question, it's not a trick question. What's the word for God in verse 1? God. Okay, so God is God. Okay, so that's the word L, which is just the kind of general... I mean, it's God, but it's not special God, all right? Did you notice the sudden shift in verse 7? What's the word for God in verse 7? Lord. And what does Lord mean when you see Lord like that? 
when you see Lord capital letters in your Bible? Yahweh. So that's the special name for God that he, that he gave to Moses, remember? So notice the shift. It's almost as if God is saying, look, if you look at creation, you will, you'll, you'll see many special things, but creation can't get you into that personal relationship with God. Can't get you to God. And so the sun gives light and it gives heat. That's what the six tells us. Uh, nothing is hidden from its heat. But look at verse 11. The sun gives light and warning. Sorry, did I mean verse 11? Uh, it gives light to the gives light to the eyes. Uh, sorry, verse 8. So the sun gives heat, but the word actually opens our eyes. <coughs> and so what does God's word do? It, God's word brings God's people together and it moulds them into the people that God wants them to be. So, uh, so we've got uh, our first two sections, sun, word, and then the last section, rock, verses 12 to 14. So the psalmist is saying, you know, the word revives me, the word refreshes me. And yet, if you look at those last few verses, like verses 12 through to 14, do you think that this is someone who's been refreshed, who's been revived? It doesn't exactly sound like it. It sounds like someone who's still spiritually troubled. Now, why would that be? Well, just like the sun, God's word uh, doesn't just bless us, but it also stretches us, it also challenges us. The sun can burn us. The sun can show us things in our lives that we know need to be changed. And so by the end of by verse 12 in this third section, uh, the psalmist, well, he, he's kind of feeling uncomfortable. He's not quite feeling refreshed and revived but he's feeling troubled. And so, look at verse 12. Who can discern his error? Who can discern uh, my errors, or his er errors? Talking to the third person, forgive my hidden faults. Who can forgive? John Calvin said, Satan has so many devices by which he deludes and blinds our minds that there is not a man who knows the hundredth part of his own sins. Here the psalmist talks about his hidden faults. It's kind of scary to think of that, isn't it? Another one, verse 13. Uh, Keep your servant from willful sins, may they not rule over me. Uh, the psalmist knows that without God's help, sin will, will rule over him, will control him. And then verse 13b, uh, second part of verse 13, he talks about this great transgression. I wonder what that is. Here's a man who's troubled, who's not refreshed yet. The psalmist encounters God's word and it leaves him feeling unsure. But the psalmist's not quite finished yet, is he? And so that takes us back to that final section. Sun, word, rock. And he ends by speaking about my, oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You probably don't spend a lot of your time thinking about rocks. Uh, well, maybe someone like Linda would do because of your line of work. But rocks, well, rocks are rocks really, aren't they? Um, God is a rock. Do you think of God as a rock? I mean, what are rocks like? They're hard, unfeeling. Uh, they get in the way of things. They're often quite cold, uh, dead. God is a rock. I mean, a lot of people think that about God, don't they? He's dead, he's unfeeling, he's cold, and he's sort of not really relevant. Well, again, the Israelites, they didn't think that about rocks. They were quite into rocks. Uh, rocks were important to them. Rocks were important uh, in their history. Think of when the children of Israel were traveling through the desert, how did they get their water? At one point, Moses had to strike a rock, didn't he? What came out? Life came out of the rock. Uh, David had to escape from his enemies, especially Saul, and he hid behind rocks and he got shelter 
in the desert from the heat. Uh, rocks were um, homes for many people. They were a strong foundation. So the Israelites, well, to them rocks were important. The psalmist then begins with the sun and then he ends with a rock. The Word of God shows the psalmist his own problems, his own weakness. The Word of God acts like a kind of mirror to his soul and shows him his need of God. A bit like that second song we sang, I Surrender. You know, when we read the Word and it really impacts us, all we can do is say, I surrender. There's nothing I can do here. I know I'm struggling. Sun, Word, Rock. But the good news is that we end with the rock. The word points us to the rock. Points us back to God. But how can we know this is true? How can we know that that prayer at the end of this psalm will get answered? It's a prayer, isn't it? Verse 14, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. That's a prayer. I wonder if the psalmist knew it would get answered. Or well, we can. How can we know? How can we know that our thoughts will be understood? How can my friend who wrote to me know that God really is there, even when he doesn't feel like it? In the New Testament, Jesus came as the living word, didn't he? He came into the world, and he came into the world as a rock. Came as the rock and the redeemer. How did he redeem? Well, one day he would die under the sun, and people would shout out to him, you can't even save yourself, you're not much of a rock. And three days later, another rock was rolled away, and the rock was empty, and Jesus was alive. We live under the sun, uh, but we live by the word. And the word leads us to the rock. And when we are led to the rock, we join with all of creation, with all of culture, in praising God once again. We find that we have a purpose. We find that our purpose is to join in with the great song of glory that verse 1 speaks about at the beginning of the psalm. Son, Word, rock. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the book of Psalms. Uh, help each one of us to keep meditating on these Psalms, keep praying them day by day in, in our work, in our leisure, in our family life, in church. Uh, at all times, Lord, may we use these words that you've given us to pray back to you that we would join in that great chorus of creation in glorifying you.